Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, the host for this program. I was just thinking what a joy it is to always be here every week to introduce to you men and women who, because of their love for Jesus Christ uh, and by the work of grace, open their heart to the Catholic Church. And often people who, last thing they ever thought of was become Catholic, and then here they are, home. And of course, that's the theme of the program, their journey home. And our guest tonight, I've looked forward to having uh, Father Eric, Eric Bergman on the program for a long time because his story is unique in many ways because of uh, the fact that he didn't come in alone. And so he's a former uh, Anglican minister and he's going to talk, give you a story in a little bit, but I want to remind you of the phone numbers and email so you can call us and become a part of this program. 1-800-221-9460. If you're outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980 or you can send us an email, journeyhome at ewtn.com. Father Bergman, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you very it's much. It's great to finally get you here. Thank you very much. Uh, I bet you uh, 10, 15 years ago you would never dream to be on a program never. like this. Never. But you had, you did have sensi sensitivities and desires to be a part of the one church. You've had that all along. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it's a great joy to have you here. And uh, every week I get out of the way as soon as I can because uh, what is particularly interesting to the audience is where'd you come from spiritually? What led to this moment? So why don't you go ahead and share that with us. Well, thank you. I, I was uh, one of five children. My parents have been married uh, 41 years. Hmm. And uh, they raised us in the Anglican Church. They were both converts, actually, uh, eventually to Catholicism. But uh, my father was raised a Presbyterian, and my mother a Methodist. Hmm. And they converted to, to uh, Anglicanism after they got married. Hmm. And they were confirmed in the Anglican Church on October 31st, 1967, and later, uh, totally by coincidence, or rather God incidents, they were confirmed in the Catholic Church on October 31st, 2005, so uh, <laughs> 38 years later. But they had raised us all, we were all baptized in the uh, Anglican tradition. Uh, we were all raised in the church. My, my father uh, was a vestryman for a time at our uh, Anglican parish. My, my mother uh, was a Sunday school teacher so they were very involved in the church, and as a result, so were uh, me and my uh, five, uh, my, my, me and my four siblings. Uh, my sister uh, Chris and my sister Beck and Sarah, all of them sang in the girls' choir, and my brother David and I sang in the men's and boys' choir. So in an Anglican tradition, there's the, the uh, s at least traditionally, uh, the boys' choir sang with the men, and the uh, women and girls' choir sang at a different, uh, actually at a different Eucharist. So well, you boys sing the girls' parts, right? Exactly right. Uh, I learned how to sing soprano, and when my voice changed, I never learned how to sing another part. So I was, I was, uh, uh, I'm still uh, deficient in that regard. But I, I think that I, I do an okay job chanting the mass. But, but uh, we did learn how to uh, sing, and, and did a great job. Also, uh, were altar boys, as well. And and after I went to college, uh, I sort of. Uh, drifted away for a time, mm -hmm. though I was involved on an occasional basis in the Canterbury Club, which is the name for the, for the uh, Episcopal sort of college youth group. Oh, uh, comparable to the Newman Society. Exactly, kind of exactly. Of exactly. So yeah. many colleges that have a significant Anglican population will have a Canterbury Club, mm -hmm. and I, was, uh, I would occasionally go to the, to the Eucharist there. And after I was uh, graduated from James Madison University, where I attended undergraduate work. I had majored in German and international affairs. I, decide, I desired that I wanted to be a, a diplomat. I wanted to serve in the Foreign <laughs> Service. So I went to uh, London to get some experience overseas. And it was in London that I really came back into the church. I went around. It's uh, the, the crucible, really, of Anglicanism, obviously. Yeah. So, so I went to uh, many different churches throughout uh, Great Britain from uh, far up in um, uh, the Lake District, all the way to, uh, over to Peterborough, to Canterbury, London. I went around to these different churches, and really, uh, that's where God uh, began to call me back. And I actually, during my time in London, had a uh, conversion experience where I had been running really from God for a time, for about four years, and uh, it was in London. I was actually in a in a subway. Uh, we were delayed for one reason or another, uh, sitting in a in a subway car, just sitting there for a half hour and a half hour, and and. Uh, Really, I, I had a conversion experience. I was overwhelmed uh, by the love that Jesus had for me. And I recognized in that moment 
uh, the love, moreover, that Jesus had for everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was that the, the same love that he had for me was the love that he had uh, for people. And, and, and it was, I think it was an important experience because here I was in uh, the seat of the former British Empire, really, and so you have people from all over the globe, literally, mm -hmm. uh, and they all speak English uh, because they're in London. And so I get these experiences from all these people from all over the globe, and it was a, it was a wonderful, uh, really, broadening of my horizons, and at the same time, I'm recognizing that really I have a call uh, to minister to these people whom God loves so much. Yeah. And so I returned home, and as I, as I got home, the, the dean of the cathedral asked me if I would be the youth director and the uh, verger, essentially a glorified sexton, uh, at the parish where I was, the, uh, I was, I was a parishioner of the cathedral in Bethlehem. And I uh, accepted. And at the same time, I interviewed with the State Department. I had passed the Foreign Service exam, uh, the written exam, and then I got to interview. And at the end of the interview, uh, at the exit interview, when they were told, told me essentially that I failed, uh, they told me that I, w I had been too honest. And so it was an affirmation uh -huh. that what I desired for me was not what God wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And I finally, after having run away for five years, decided to answer God's call and I told the uh, dean of the cathedral I want to uh, become an Episcopal clergyman. And he said, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> so that was really, uh, again, another affirmation of my call. And so I went on to seminary. I went to Yale University for, after two years, uh, I went on to Yale University uh, and I went to the Divinity School and I graduated in 1997 and I was ordained an Episcopal priest in 1997, and I was assigned by my bishop, by my Episcopal bishop, to a uh, church in downtown Scranton called St. Luke's, where I served as the curate for two years. And after, uh, after that, I, I was uh, the rector of the Church of the Good Shepherd in Scranton, another parish in the city, uh, for another five years. So I, the reason I ended up in Scranton, even though I am from Bethlehem, mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania, the reason I ended up in Scranton is that's where my bishop had actually assigned me. Okay. Pretty happy as a, as a minister. And I was. I, I was. I. I. I'd, uh, things are going uh, well at your parish, right? They were very well. In fact, I'd. I'd, I'd taken a parish over that. That I, I mean, I hadn't taken it over. The bishop had really uh, encouraged them to receive me, and I received them. And and I was there uh, for five years, and we had uh, really sort of uh, brought a parish, really built it up. After having, they didn't have a. They didn't have had a clergyman for three mm -hmm. years before I got there. And so things were going very well, uh, and and uh, we were growing, and our attendance had really uh, doubled since since I had become the rector, and uh, things were going swimmingly, except for the fact that I was having these uh, doubts about uh, a number of things, yeah. uh, uh, and I was going towards I was moving moving uh, closer and closer to Rome. Now, in your then as a pastor, were you serving in what would be considered an Anglo-Catholic setting? It was. I, you it might need to explain it to the audience too to understand the variety there. Yes, in, in Anglicanism, we have one book, or we had, I should say, I had one book, and it's the Book of Common Prayer. And everybody uses this one book. But on the same time, you have these different variations of theology. You have the low churchmen uh, so, who, for instance, don't believe that uh, the the sacrament is the body and blood of Christ, and then you have the high angle Catholics who believe that it is, mm -hmm. and, and they'll have a more formal worship and, and use what we call smells and bells, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the low churchmen who, who don't believe in the real presence uh, won't use the smells and bells, but we're all still using the same exact book, okay. the same exact uh, liturgy, uh, and, and our parish was distinguished in that uh, the, the search committee had made it clear when they were looking for a new rector that they didn't want a woman priest. And uh, so that was something that was very attractive to me, mm -hmm. uh, but it also made it very hard for the bishop to find someone to fill that place. And they also had the altar, and one of the things they asked me in my interview is, are you going to move the altar on us? And because the altar was, is, I shouldn't say was, is still against the wall and the, and the clergyman there when he celebrates Holy Communion celebrates uh, ad orientum, yeah. celebrates uh, facing the same direction as all the people. So in a sense, it was high church. It was not Anglo-Catholic, but it was high church. All right. Okay, I want to get right to the question of what opened your heart, because I know there was a long journey yes. that led up to this. Indeed, I, I was, I was uh, 
uh, as I said, raised in a, in a stable home environment. I was very blessed to have parents that, that uh, uh, allowed us to seek the truth, and my father was very much dedicated to the truth. One of the things that's very true of my dad and my mom both is that they don't have any time for falsehood, uh, very much uh, uh, point us in the direction and that the point of life uh, really is uh, to serve God, obviously, but while we're serving God, to seek uh, what is true. And so they had a, a profound influence on me, uh, for one. And then in 1993, out comes this encyclical about the truth, uh, Veritatis Splendor, the Splendor of Truth. And now, obviously, we were Anglican, so I'm working from a different, completely different perspective uh, than the Holy Father is, but I read it. There was a man named Father Vincent York who gave me a copy of uh, Veritatis Splendor because we had served together. I was the verger, as I said, the glorified sexton serving at this wedding. And uh, he came because in order for a Catholic marriage to be valid, uh, a Catholic priest has to be present. Well, they were married in, in our Anglican church, but Father Vincent York came. And in our conversation, one day he shows up at my house and gives me uh, Veritatis Splendor. Splendor. <laughs> and and that was, that reading that encyclical sort of put me on the path without me knowing it, put me on the path because what John Paul discusses in there is the reality that there is one truth. And that in the use of our freedom, uh, which God has given us and wants us to have, we must use it responsibly because there's a difference between license, which is the freedom to do whatever we want, mm -hmm. and liberty, which is the freedom to do what is right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there is absolute truth, and we must, use our truth, we must use our freedom responsibly in pursuit of that truth. So it really fit in with the way my mother and father had, had raised me uh, in, in terms of looking towards the truth. Now obviously, I wasn't to the point where I believed that the Catholic truth was the truth, but I understood philosophically, because John Paul was a great philosopher, I understood that was true. At the time, well, at that time you were, you were not an uh, Anglican minister yet. No, but when you were an Anglican minister, based on your understanding of what you just said, how would you have determined what was true? I think it was really left up to, uh, this is one of the difficulties of, of, of Anglican theology, is that it was uh, left up to me to a certain degree. I had a certain element of freedom. I tried to use my freedom responsibly as an Anglican pastor, but, but at the same time, uh, the bishop might have had a different conception of what the truth was. And since he was my boss, uh, uh, ultimately, when it, when, when, when it came down to it, his version of the truth would prevail. Well, you said, for example, that within the Anglican Communion, there were those that believed it was the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and those that, of course, didn't. Right. And I also know that there are a percentage of, 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 Catholic, of Anglican priests that have great variety of views on morality, great varieties on views, that even very traditional views like the Trinity and the divinity of Christ. Exactly. Was there that freedom, authentic freedom within the Anglican priesthood to have those views or are you just in rebellion against the church when you take those views? No, no, no. I think that, I think that, I think that there was, um, this is one of the things that John Paul talks about too, is that in, he talks about really the clash of the absolutes, that when we are left, and this is in Veritatis Splendor, uh, when we are left to decide for ourselves uh, what is absolutely true, when we ourselves are the ultimate arbiter of what is true, uh, ultimately we're going to find that we come into conflict with others who have the same conception for themselves, that they are the ultimate arbiter of what is true. And what we find is that it results in chaos. So the Episcopal Church is very good at encouraging people to have their own version of the truth. But what you find is that when there's a moral disorder and that nobody is assigning himself to looking to a higher authority. Uh, what you find that there is, when there's moral disorder in that way, there's also political disorder. Mm -hmm. So what we find was that everything was determined really by who got the most votes at convention on the diocesan level, then general convention. Everything was ultimately up for grabs. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the weaknesses, it's one of the catalysts, it's not a reason. Bishop Doherty, Bishop John Doherty uh, was my mentor going through the process as I converted to Catholicism, as I went through the pastor provision process. One of the things he says, always make a distinction for people when you talk about your conversion between the catalyst, between the occasion for your conversion, which led you to reject Anglicanism and to say that this is not what is true, and the reason for your conversion, which led you to embrace Catholicism. Because yeah. I could have left Anglicanism behind and gone off and been something else. Right. But in uh, fact, uh, what I did is I became a Catholic. Yeah, yeah. all right. So Veritatis Splendor is the one of the sparks that got you going. It was, absolutely. and then. Then when I, uh, my wife and I were, were uh, 
preparing for uh, to get married, uh, we we uh, decided that uh, we would not uh, contracept, and this was something that that uh, uh, it wasn't really a theological. We didn't have a theological understanding of why we wouldn't. It was just repugnant to us, and so it was more of a ooh at the uh, ick factor, yeah. you know. So <laughs> so uh, we decided that we would figure out how we wouldn't get pregnant then and not and not contracept. So we go to find out how to do that and the only people that could teach us was the Catholic Church. The only people that would even consider that was the Catholic Church. So we actually went to the Diocese of Allentown and went to natural family planning classes in, in uh, the Diocese of Allentown. And after we got married we said, well there's no reason we need to use this information because we don't have For a legitimate reason. reason. <laughs> we have no reason not to conceive. But we still, it was, and it got me thinking, the only people that are teaching what I believe about uh, human sexuality, about the moral life, is the Catholic Church. So there was a disconnect. The church of which I was a member uh, did not teach what I actually believed. And I might teach people that, but again, as I say, there could be some other priest, uh, other Episcopal clergyman who could contradict me. Indeed, even my bishop could contradict me. Yeah. All right. So it's pro-life issues then, we'll uh, open that for your... Absolutely, my, my wife was incredibly not was is incredibly pro-life, yeah. and 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 so out comes this other encyclical in 1998, Evangelium Vitae, the the, the Gospel of Life, yeah. and uh, the Pope is very. It's another uh, great book that uh, that uh, uh, our viewers need to read. Uh, he articulates the threats to life, uh, articulates why uh, we need to embrace life, and also tells us gives us strategies for how we might create a culture of life mm -hmm. in opposition to this culture of death, and and so. Uh, these two, these two uh, encyclicals, uh, Veritatis Splendor and the Gospel of Life, really teach me about the teaching authority of the Church. Uh, not that I accepted it yet, but <laughs> but that that the wisdom, the things, the very things that I believed, were there. And at the same time, while I'm reading this encyclical, I had time because I was a curate. I was not the rector. I didn't have all the responsibilities uh, that that the rector had. Uh, I had time to study Ephesians five. And Ephesians 5 taught me uh, the theology, one, of, of marriage, uh, two, of, of the priesthood, three, of uh, human sexuality, while I'm studying this. And lo and behold, I go to a, a conference a few years later, Theology of the Body, Christopher West was the, uh, was the speaker, and uh, I was the only Episcopalian there. And I, <laughs> I, uh, I loved it. I said, uh, this is exactly what the Holy Spirit was teaching me through my study of Ephesians 5. So, so, and just coincidentally, of course, God incidentally, I mean, God, God moved it this way. Father James Parker was there. He's the first priest That's right. That's right. ordained through the pastoral provision. And he happened to be at this conference because he's a priest down there near Charleston. And he said, if you ever want to come our way, you know you're welcome. So he said that to me uh, when I was down there. And, I, and so I began to investigate the pastoral provision. And that was in 2002. A uh, couple questions at this stage in your journey. Number one, are you teaching any of this stuff to your people? Yes. In fact, I went back from that Theology of the Body conference, and this was one of the things that really uh, was the key then eventually to having so many people come with me, is that uh, we had believed the Theology of the Body from the beginning, not knowing that we believed it, my wife and I, not knowing that we believed it, we believed the Theology of the Body from the beginning. And eventually the Holy Spirit taught us, eventually it was affirmed in the teachings of John Paul II in the Theology of the Body, the book, mm -hmm. uh, in the, with the help of Christopher West. And so I went back and when I did my Bible study, I, at, at, my, at the Episcopal Church, of which I was the rector by this time, I began to teach about how wrong the Anglican Communion had been in 1930 when they had approved at Lambeth for the use of contraception for married couples. In case the audience doesn't realize that that was really the spark that opened the whole door for that. It was that Anglican conference. Absolutely, and after that all the Protestant denominations adopted okay. it. And so I began to teach that this was actually an error mm -hmm. and that if we are truly going to be Catholic, if we're truly going to be reconciled to the Holy See, which is what the Episcopal, uh, the Lambeth Quadrilateral says, I mean, it's in the B Book of Common Prayer that we want to have a uh, union with the Holy See, uh, that, that there needs to be unity of uh, all Christians. And uh, uh, I began to teach that the, 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 that the church is wrong about this, and of course I'm the rector, so I can teach that. <laughs> and uh, and there, 
the people, some of the people are totally uh, shocked, uh, not, not to say appalled, but shocked. And they eventually came around. And, and so many of the people, when I announced later that I was going to become a Catholic, they, in terms of Catholic morality, had already been exposed to that, mm. and the, the theology of the body had, by me and Bible study, been explained to them. The other question was, where was your wife on this, on this journey? Well, I think that she, uh, I, a great story about my wife and, and this, she, she was shocked at first. <laughs> we, we, I went to a, uh, I went to a, a conservative Anglican, conservative, I say in quotes, they were supposed to be, you know, conservative. There was, there was a political alliance more than it was a moral alliance, yeah. which I found yeah. out. But it was people who were really opposed to the chaos that was occurring in the Episcopal Church because of their departure from Christian morality. Yeah. And so we had this conference in, in, on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. And I went there and I began, I thought, among my Anglican brother clergy, I could bring up this subject of how the embrace of contraception in 1930 was responsible for where we were now with the embrace of many other immoralities. So, so they said, no. They didn't see it at all. They didn't see it at all. In fact, moreover, they said contraception has been a great blessing to uh, the nation and to the church and to the world. And I was out on a, I was, I was shattered because I realized even as I looked for allies, I didn't have any. Didn't have any yeah. So I went out on the Chesapeake Bay in a kayak and uh, realized there that I had to become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I told my wife, and, and had she, she known up at this point that you were kind of got well she she was ex she had been exposed to Veritatis Splendor. she knew how much I love that and and um, <laughs> and I and I had and I had talked to her about St. Augustine the city of God and about the necessity of order I mean she could see the chaos uh, yeah. uh, in the Episcopal Church as easily as I could and and um, and she of course was was pro-life and and so but but when I said we have to become Catholic uh, she said, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but a day later she said, you're right. It, it was, it was it, the, 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 when the idea became, she, it, the shock of it had to wear off. And it only, it literally only took her a day. And she said, you're absolutely right. And, and it was, everything just moved very rapidly at that mm -hmm. point. And I went to see Bishop Martino in, fortunately. Catholic Bishop? Catholic Bishop of yeah, Scranton, right. Bishop Joseph Martino. Uh, received me because of my friendship with uh, Monsignor Joe Quinn. He introduced me to him, which is very important mm. uh, that 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 he could vouch for me. Okay. And he got me this uh, interview, really, with the bishop. And we talked, and he said to me, "Eric, don't be surprised if your parish doesn't come with you, because he had been through the process before mm. uh, when he was an auxiliary bishop of uh, Philadelphia." where uh, a man had converted and, and the parish did not come with him. Right. A month later, I went to see him, having resigned, and I already had 15 families who wanted to come. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were really the core of that Bible study mm -hmm. that I had taught, where I had actually taught the church's teaching on the immorality of contraception. And, and uh, so I said, I'm coming, uh, whether I'll be ordained or not, obviously I'm coming with my hands empty. Mm -hmm. And I have a number of people that want to come with me. And we would like to see the pastoral provision implemented whereby I could continue to be their pastor and we could retain certain elements of our Anglican patrimony that are consistent with Catholic faith and practice. Mm -hmm. So for the next two months, uh, really, we prayed and, uh, and sort of gathered, gathered the people together. and. I was thinking, boy, I, 15 families isn't really enough to <laughs> support me and my family. Because at the time, I had, I had three children, and I said, you know, I'm going to need health insurance. Uh, I'm going to need uh, an income of some sort. So I went out and I began to look for jobs. And my treasurer called me and said, I've pulled the, I have pulled the people that are coming into the church with you, and we have asked that you please stay here. Don't go away. We have 60% of what we need to support you and your family. Please stay and be our pastor. Don't go away and find a job somewhere out of town because the group will fall apart.
And so we simply trusted. We said, well, Lord, we have 60% of what we need. We'll trust you to provide the rest. And interestingly, uh, more people joined us. <laughs> so that by the end of the by end of those months, I, I resigned on August um, on October 24th. I left my position as rector on December 31st. In those two months, uh, we uh, the group grew, and we had enough to support me uh, with help from people from around the country and even around the world, who sent contributions to us to help us sustain mm -hmm. our ministry. And then from the time you resigned, you went through the whole pastoral provision process until you were then accepted as, uh, or to be ordained as a Catholic priest. During that whole time, you, you talk about the, 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 the fellowship that you had established, right? The, right, right, indeed. The it was, society. So yeah, St. Thomas More Society, we took as our patron St. Thomas More, who was killed because he wanted England to be reconciled to the Holy See. Right. And this is what our mission is, is to reconcile our English brothers, uh, people of English patrimony to the Holy See. This is what we feel is, is, is the focus of our mission, what we believe, what we know uh, is, is what we are called to do. And, and so we have retained uh, certain Anglican practices. For instance, we had evening prayer every Sunday night because I couldn't, uh, we couldn't have the Eucharist because we weren't Catholic yet. Right. We had evening prayer at which I was permitted to preach and uh, we met for 10 months until we were finally confirmed, as I said, on October 31st, 2005. And my dossier was compiled, sent to the Holy See for consideration with a cover letter from Bishop Martino saying that if you will permit me to ordain this man, I will ordain this man, and I will appoint him the leader of this group of converts who has come into the church with him. Mm -hmm. And that was sent in June of 2006, and my rescript came back in February of 2007. So just this year, my rescript came back saying that, yes, uh, Bishop Martino, you may ordain this man. And then I, was, uh, I, went, I quickly went on retreat. I was ordained to the diaconate on March 24th. I was ordained to the priesthood on April 21st. And we continue to use, uh, since October 31st, 2005, we have had an Anglican usage mass every single week. And now that I'm ordained, obviously, I celebrate that mass, but not only do it every week, do it every day. Every day. So we have a daily mass uh, at St. Anthony of Padua Church in uh, North Scranton due to the intercession of people like Monsignor Bill Feldkamp, who was our, uh, mm -hmm. he was our uh, pastor during the time that I was not uh, ordained. He was the one that looked over our group and really stood up for us, uh, did what had to d be done in order that we would s stay as a cohesive group. You use the, what's called the Anglican news. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because one thing I've also experienced is that there are an awful lot of lifelong Catholics that aren't comfortable I don't quite understand even the Eastern Rite Catholic churches, let alone an, an Anglican use. Right. They, so, they sometimes don't realize are they truly Catholic? Or not. Right, right. Of course, this is one of the one of the challenges that we've encountered is that is that there is a, a certain uh, suspicion that perhaps we aren't really totally faithful to the magisterium because we are using a liturgy that's different from most Latin Rite Catholics. And of course, we are Latin Rite Catholics, but we know uh, that that in the Diocese of Milan, for instance, there is the Ambrosian uh, use. That people call it Ambrosian Rite, but it's really a usage of the Roman Rite. And 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 we have uh, our uh, the most Arabic in in Spain. There's there's different liturgies, so there is a different way of celebrating the same holy sacrifice of the Mass. Mm -hmm. And it's in it, and the only parts that were kept were those that were consistent with Catholic faith and practice. In fact, the Anglican use uh, canon is a 16th century translation of the Mass that was used in England at that time. Mm -hmm. So the canon that Cranmer wrote in the 1640s uh, was not valid Mass. And so it had to be removed. Mm -hmm. And into it was put a translation done by Coverdale, who was actually a Protestant. Mm -hmm. He translated it for polemical purposes to say how evil the Mass was. But in fact, now, in God's great irony, we are using it now <laughs> as part of the uh, Anglican usage liturgy. So it's simply a, a variation. It's the only variation of the Roman rite that is permitted in the United States. All right. Let's take a break, and we'll come back just a moment with your questions for Father Berkman. Thank you.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Father Eric Bergman. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us, condensing it. I mean, that's always hard. So yes, many yes. You talk about those coincidences, those God incidents. It was what I found after being a convert for a number of years, you start realizing more and more and more and more all the way, the ways that God was touching you way back when you didn't realize until you get, you get the, the, the privilege of hindsight to see the ways in which he was open. And you shared a bit of that with us. We've got a lot of emails and phone calls. Uh, the first one uh, comes from uh, Rushad in Florida. He says, Dear Father Eric, I was received into full communion with the Catholic Church yesterday and received my first Holy Communion. Rashad, welcome home. Uh, that's <laughs> wonderful. I had been longing for some time to receive our most holy Redeemer in the Blessed Sacrament, and my first communion was everything I had hoped it would be, give praise to our holy God. What was it like for you to receive the Holy Eucharist and to celebrate Mass for the first time? Thank you, Rashad. One of the things that any Anglican clergyman struggles with is the suspicion that what he's doing isn't real. And that was within me the entire time that I was an Anglican clergyman, because we all know about the papal bull uh, in the late 1890s, Leo XIII, yeah. who said that Anglican orders are not valid. And so I knew about it, and I kept it with me, and it's one of those things that I had to keep pushing down. Hmm. And so the great joy of uh, becoming a Catholic and receiving the sacrament in uh, on October 31st, 2005, is that I knew for the first time in my life that it was real. Uh, now, I thought I probably, when I was younger, a young boy, I probably thought it was real then too. But as the doubts were introduced in my late teens, early 20s, uh, to the time that I was, I mean, I was 34 years old when I was when mm -hmm. I was confirmed. Uh, that was a long period of time to wonder whether what I was really doing, if I was just playing church, or mm. whether I was actually receiving the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. And, and in fact, uh, that first time I received, I knew it was real. And then the first time I celebrated Mass, mm. uh, con-celebrating uh, at my ordination, uh, that's the first time that every priest celebrates. Uh, mm. <laughs> so that's, I mean, <laughs> we have our first Mass the next day, but the first time to know that I was actually... Uh, celebrating the Mass, that, that uh, overwhelming, uh, tears of joy. Hmm. All right, thank you, Father. Take our first caller, Katie from Florida. Hello, what's your question? Hello, Father and Marcus. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, oh yes, yes, yes very yes, much yes. so. <laughs> Do, can you hear me now? Yes, yes I can. Yes, yes. Can you hear okay. us? Okay, I was raised Catholic and well-trained for 12 years in a Catholic school, but I left the church in my early 20s and participated fully in an Episcopal church for over 20 years. Now that I've joyfully and thankfully made the journey home, and I thank you for your show, my question is, how do I answer my Episcopal friends and family about why I have made this journey and returned to the Catholic Church? I know why, but people try to answer for me and act as if I have just moved from one church to another, mm -hmm. and I'm at a loss on how to give a correct answer. Thank you very much. Well, welcome home, Katie. And thank you. That's a question. great. That is a, that is a great question, because here we get to talk about the essence really at the difference between Anglicanism and Catholicism. Mm. And Anglicanism, as I said before, I talked, I made that reference to that one book that everybody has. And yet, there's obviously, all you have to do is read the news reports, there's no uniformity of belief yeah. in the Episcopal Church. In fact, even the bishops can't agree with what they agree on. At least in the Catholic Church, even if you have dissenters here and there, the bishops all say, this is what the truth is. And uh, obviously, we have ultimately the Magisterium, the Holy Father, to appeal to. This is what the truth is. In the Catholic Church, we don't have just one book that we use to celebrate the Mass. In fact, there's 22 different churches that make up the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And then there's several more, as we talked before, just bef uh, about the, the uses, uh, Ambrosia and Arabic, the Anglican use, different ways to celebrate the same holy sacrifice of the Mass. Mm -hmm. So in the Catholic Church, we have really an appreciation of unity and diversity, an appreciation that, that you can bring your gifts into the church. The church does not want you to leave your gifts at the door, and you don't all have to do same things the same way. We want you, we want you to retain the gifts that God has given you 
and we want you to bring them to us to make the whole better. Because the Catholic Church believes in complementarity. We see that in the complementarity of men and women, and how the purpose, obviously, of men and women coming together is to bring forth life. It's the only way that life comes about is, is bringing together a man and a woman. So, in the same way, when we bring together all these different gifts of all the people from around the world, we bring forth life. There's a, uh, in Anglicanism, there is not that same appreciation of the different gifts. Moreover, there's not a confession of one truth. There's not a confession of one truth. The Catholic Church, there's the confession of one truth, and we have different ways of celebrating it. In, in, the, in the Episcopal Church, there's one way of doing it, and, and yet we can all believe whatever we want. So, so that essential uh, difference is a way to say, I moved from chaos into order, I moved from death into life. Yeah. And that's the, that's the way that I would articulate that. Yeah. Very good, thank you, Father. One reason I'm not commenting because we've got so many good emails here. Uh, I want to make sure we get to all of them. Kristen from Pennsylvania, dear Father Eric, mm -hmm. I have been looking into attending an Anglican News Parish. How is it going to differ from the ordinary form of the Mass that I attend now? Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Kristen, for email. Wonderful question. The Anglican usage, as I said before, is a 16th century translation of, uh, it's a 16th century English, and the Canon of the Mass is a 16th century translation of Canon 1. So if you know Canon 1 in the Roman Rite, it's the same canon, hmm. but it's a, it's a different translation. The words are a little bit more formal. It's really Elizabethan English. Hmm. Uh, so that's one thing. That's the thing that you'll notice first. Secondly, you'll notice that the piece is in a different place. Uh, in uh, the Anglican usage of the Roman Rite, we don't have the confession right at the beginning. We have the prayers of the people. Everything is same, similar to the, to the uh, prayers of the people. And then after the prayers of the people, we have the confession of sins. Mm. And after the confession of sins, because we are to make peace with our brother before we bring our gifts to the altar, we have the peace. Mm. So the peace precedes the canon of the Mass. There's obviously a theological reason for it. So we have uh, the prayers of the people, confession of sin, the peace, and then uh, the canon of the Mass. So the peace is not after the Our Father as it is in the Roman Rite. So, so there is that difference. And, and of course, uh, our devotional practices are a little bit different. We kneel a lot more uh, in, in, for instance, the Collect of the Day. In the Roman Rite, the people stand in ours, they kneel. And uh, we, we kneel for the, from the beginning of the canon of the Mass all the way to the end. There's no uh, standing up uh, for the Our Father, for example. And we kneel to receive the Blessed Sacrament and receive it under both species, uh, both the body and the blood. All right. Just in case anyone was, didn't hear this, a totally valid Mass. Absolutely. Uh, no Catholic bishop is going to permit one of his priests to celebrate an invalid Mass. Right. So, so just because it is different does not make it uh, invalid. Diversity is not disloyalty. The other thing that I want to emphasize um, is that within the Catholic Church there are 21 rites. 22. 22 rites, and then within the Latin rite there are a variety of, of, of these uses. But that does not, because there, we see the variety, that does not therefore give a local priest the freedom to take that rite and kind of run with it in his own <laughs> way, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. And, and the bishop expects, of course, that I will do, I celebrate both Masses. I celebrate I, cel I mean, I, d I celebrate the one holy sacrifice of the Mass, but I do it in two different ways. I do the Roman Rite, mm -hmm. and I follow the rubrics in the Roman Rite, and I do the Anglican usage, and I follow the rubrics in the Anglican usage. I do not mix them. Yeah. Uh, I do not uh, introduce uh, Anglican usage practices in the Roman Rite any more than I introduce uh, Roman Rite practices into the Anglican usage. So, so there is a, a, di a, a distinction. There's not, it's, again, it's obedience, and it's, I'm not my own authority. Yeah. It's, it's a great freedom knowing that there is an authority. Well, it's, as, as you said earlier, it's the difference between license and liberty. Absolutely, absolutely. And sadly, I mean, that's what frustrates me as a convert to the church and when I visit parishes around the country, and it frustrates me when I see license. That's right. As opposed to liberty. Yes. You know, there, there are certain aspects of the Mass where there is liberty on certain things, but not license. That's right. And that's disobedience. That's so we need to pray for our church and our priests and bishops and laity to recognize the beauty of that liberty yet contained in obedience. Absolutely, the and the, beauty of that. the one more thing that's different about our Masses, the, the music is very beautiful, it's different uh, than, than what you might hear at a Roman Rite Mass. 
but it's very, very beautiful. All right, thank you very much. Phone call from Bob in Pennsylvania. Hello, Bob, what's your question? Uh, hi, Mark, it's a yep. great show that you have. And thank Father you. Eric, this is Bob from Avis. Hello, Bob. Good to see you on primetime TV. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Father, how can we get the message uh, to our Anglican brothers and sisters that there's plenty of room for them across the Tiber? <laughs> thank you, Bob. How do, we, how do we get that message? This is one way. Really, one of the things that, that I find about the pastoral provision uh, and the Anglican usage of the Roman Rite, it's one of it's like the best kept secret in the Catholic Church. We have this means by which people can come into the church and, as I said, retain their gifts and retain this beautiful liturgy. In fact, Father Charles Connor, who was our catechetical instructor, mm -hmm. and our, uh, he was also my mentor as I went through the process. He actually was the man who tutored me as I went, uh, uh, as I had to be and educated. That, and that's that the father, Charles Connor, that many of you watching EWTN are very familiar with. Same man, yes, yes absolutely. Right. He was my, he, I was blessed to have him as our catechetical catechi instructor, one, and then two, my mentor. Uh, he says, this Mass is beautiful. He said, this, this translation is absolutely beautiful. So, they, so we have this, this beauty that we're allowed to retain, and yet so many people don't know about it. So the, mm -hmm. one, the way that we do first is by letting them know about it. Mm -hmm. And two, t having an understanding of uh, being able to articulate, hopefully uh, even better than I can, why, uh, why the Catholic Church is such a blessing and why having uh, order over chaos, uh, why, why order is superior to chaos, why truth is superior to falsehood. Simply being able to say, the Church wants you, the Church wants your gifts, uh, the Church doesn't desire you to leave your gifts at the door, and being able to say that in that not that, that we believe uh, we are uh, superior to anybody, right. but that we complement the church. The English people have been cut off from the church for 500 years almost, almost 500 years, and it should be the desire of everyone to see the English people reconciled to the church. So, so we have to really talk in those terms. We have to talk in terms of what the mission of the past revision is and what the mission of the Anglican usage is. Mm -hmm. It is to reconcile the English people who for too long have been cut off from the church, to reconcile them to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I was just thinking at this point, in case any are listening and you want to know more about it, let me at least give you the, the email for the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org. You can call the Coming Home Network or contact them if you have any questions. Do you have a, an email, or should I just have them call, sure give do. us, and then go to you? Uh, no, Bergman at St. Thomas More Society dot org. Very I good. mean, that's that's uh, we have a St. Thomas More Society dot org is our website, and in fact, if you just Google St. Thomas More Society, we're the most, we're hit the most. Right. So we'll, we'll be right there at the top of the list. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, let's take uh, this next email, Mike from Pennsylvania. Dear Father, could you please explain the difference between the Episcopal and Catholic liturgy, i.e., does the priest face the people, et cetera? Did Vatican II have an effect on the Episcopal liturgy? He says, welcome home and God bless. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, Vatic the Second Vatican Council did, in fact, have an impact on the Episcopal liturgy. The Second Vatican Council happened first. The Episcopal Church redid their prayer book in 1979. And, and for many uh, churches then, in fact, probably the majority of the churches then adopted uh, Roman Rite, uh, almost Roman Rite norms for the celebration of the liturgy. They began to face the people. Uh, they continued to kneel for communion and so forth, but they f began to, 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 to face the people, and they used a, a modern translation of the liturgy. In the Anglican usage parishes that exist in the United States, uh, most of them use the traditional form. Uh, they and the priest and in all of them the priest faces ad orientum uh, he faces the same direction as the rest of the people would the Anglican use be closer to an English translation of the Tridentine Mass then? Indeed in fact that's that's exactly that's essentially what it is. Okay. It is yes all yes right. yes very good okay uh, Andy from Florida um, what's your question for us tonight? Yes, uh, Father, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you feel there can be a true reconciliation between the Anglican Church and, and Rome, or at least some denomination of the Anglican Church in Rome? And if you do, uh, how would we go about that, making that happen? Thank you, Andy. Great question. And the answer Aidan Nichols provided at the first Anglican Youth Conference that was held in Scranton in 2005, and he said essentially no. Anglicanism is made up of so many different churches, really, so many different denominations within Anglicanism, that a corporate reunion between Anglicanism and Rome is not really possible. Mm. Sure. Uh, 
miracle. Short of a miracle, right. right. The Lord could make it happen. Yeah, but uh, in but reality, what we uh, see. But he does give us free will. Uh, and, and, so, right. and so the likelihood that many people would reject it anyway is, is very great. Another difficulty with a corporate reunion, even of a diocese, for instance, say a diocese wanted to be reunited, is that so many clergymen in the Anglican Church are compromised in one way or another. That is, I met so many former Catholic priests who were uh, Anglican clergymen while I was an Anglican clergyman. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I can't <laughs> right now count the number that I met. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also there were uh, in the Anglican church, and, and of course if my bride uh, should God forbid die, I cannot remarry. But in, in the Anglican church, not only can a man remarry after his wife dies, he remarries after he gets divorced. And so you have some okay. uh, clergymen who are married to uh, have, have, have had several marriages. Also in the Anglican Church in many places, uh, not Nigeria, but in many places in the Anglican Church there are uh, lady priests. So, so there's, there's yeah. women's ordination, which of course is a great inhibition to uh, reunion yeah. uh, with the Holy See. So what the, Holy, the wisdom of the pastoral vision is that if we want reunion with the Holy See, there's a way to do it. Get the pastor and his people submit to the past, submit to the uh, their bishop's wisdom in implementing the pastoral provision in their particular diocese, and they can come into the church just like I did. So if they, if if, if uh, this gentleman knows of a group of people that want to be reconciled to the church, uh, tell them this is the way to do it. That there already is the means, so there's no need to wait. Uh, there's, there's the way. Let's you know get started. All right, thank you. Email from Kathy in Tennessee. She writes, "Dear Father Eric, can you explain how Anglican slash Episcopalians deal with King Henry the Eighth?" Mm. And how do they perceive the role of St. Thomas More in the split with Roman Catholicism? Thank you, Kathy. I think that one of the things that Anglicans do, and they must, uh, when you understand that Henry VIII was quite a miserable character, uh, eventually dying of syphilis, uh, uh, certainly immoral uh, in, many, in many, many ways, uh, killed two of his wives, et cetera, et cetera. What you have to do is sort of turn a blind eye to his indiscretions mm. and blame the split on political reasons. Say, it wasn't a theological question, it was a political question. Uh, but in fact, submitting to the authority of the magisterium, submitting uh, in our obedience to the Holy Father is a theological question. Mm. And, and we skirt the issue by calling it political rather than, that's how people deal with Henry VIII. Uh, they, they ignore his indiscretions, and Anglicans are very good at that. Anglicans are very good at ignoring indiscretions. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's from its very origins. Uh, so St. Thomas More, as far as St. Thomas More goes, obviously he's the man that stood up. So what did Henry do to him? Kill him. So you learn as an Anglican, uh, and the church will remind you of this, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, that the ultimate virtue in Anglicanism is compromise. And mm -hmm. we can find a way to compromise, if nothing else, and so, so Saint Thomas More is great because he didn't. He paid with his life, yeah. but he's in heaven. You know, when I look back on that whole history, the focus often goes on Henry VIII. Of course, he was in power. Although I don't think the changes that happened in the church after him were what he desired. <laughs> to certain, you know, change the liturgy and change. No, he didn't. Not. He didn't ever really consider himself not a Catholic. He himself. Exactly. But he. But I see behind him a man by the name of Woolsey, yes. who was a Catholic priest, That's right. bishop, bishop, had more influence on him than others, and interestingly probably pushed Henry to the end, gave him all kinds of permissions, That's compromise, right. That's right. it came from there. And then when Woolsey died, the person that replaced him was Thomas More, Absolutely. who was not willing to compromise. That's right. The king was expecting that of the same guy that was in the place of Wolsey. Right. You don't hear about Wolsey, but again, there's the issue. Imagine how different it would have been if instead of Wolsey influencing Henry VIII, it had been Fisher. Exactly, and he was the only bishop that stood up to him. Uh, yeah. Wolsey died, of course, eventually, uh, before disgraced. Henry. Disgraced, I mean. Yeah, yeah disgraced, he died. Yeah. Uh, but Fisher was the only, Bishop John Fisher was the only one to stand up to him. And he lost his life actually two weeks before St. Thomas More. And their feast day, uh, which for us is a major feast, is, is June the 22nd. Yeah. And, and we celebrate that uh, every year. Okay. Our caller, Linda from Florida. Hello, Linda. What's your question? Yes, hello there. Hello. hello. 
Um, my question is, first I'll share this. I was trained to be a Protestant minister, uh -huh. believing there was only one church. It's why I was led to uh, be a woman preacher. Yeah. Uh, my training led me to the Catholic Church, and um, I didn't believe a woman should be a priest. I know Episcopal priests who have left their church and became a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. How can I put my training to use as a woman cannot be a preacher either, but have a deep desire to share the good news and to minister to people? All right. Oh my great, goodness! Great question, Linda. What a what a what a, an incredible, uh, excellent, excellent, excellent question. Because what the church teaches about uh, what I what I talked about those different liturgies that we have and the way the different gifts of the different people. I said the basis that I use for that the mystery of the union between Jesus and the church and between a man and his wife. Mm -hmm. That this is complementarity from the complementarity of the particular gifts that uh, we have as men and as women. When they come together, what comes forth but life. So one of the, the, what I would tell you immediately to do is first uh, know in yourself the particular gifts that you possess and know in yourself the particular gifts that you as a woman possess and what you have. So you have to know who you are. That, that uh, the great lie of, of, of feminism is that, uh, at least as it's practiced today, is that we should all be men uh, and we should all sin like evil men. And, and, and this is not uh, God's desire. God's desire, rather, is for us to embrace who we are and, 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 and the gifts that he has given us as men and as women. So the first thing that you have to do is that. And then once you discern those gifts, what those gifts are, uh, what your particular calling as a woman is, then you will find all sorts of opportunities to influence not only other women, but other men. And embracing the truth of the complementarity of the sexes, that we weren't in competition, that's a result of the fall. God, as Jesus says, uh, from the beginning, it was not so. Uh, he made us to complement each other. How can we do that? Discern that, and you'll be on the road to helping everyone. All right, and I encourage you to, uh, Linda, uh, a wonderful encyclical by John Paul called Christo Fidelis Laici, the lay faithful in Christ. It's a tremendous encouragement to laity to recognize their very important place in the ministry of the church. I mean, all the different aspects. We don't just have a few of them. All the laity need to be readers or something. No, exactly there's a right. thousand ways in which we can reach out with the gospel. In fact, the lady that, uh, a lady is who taught my wife and I natural family planning. Again, I said, mm -hmm. uh, never put it to use, but it was the, her reaching out and her dedication and her, her love. Uh, she was the one that was there teaching it. Maybe briefly as a last thought, let's say we got a few Episcopalian Anglicans watching, why ought they make the same journey home that you made? Because it's true. And, and this is what Jesus desires, that the, 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 the falsehood of the Protestant Reformation is that uh, the greatest falsehood is a denial really ultimately of the Incarnation. Mm -hmm. That as Jesus was present as He walked the earth, and He says, I'm going to be present with you always even to the end of the age, he, there must be a corporeal reality, something that we can taste, feel, and touch, that is that presence. And that presence is not in the Episcopal Church, that presence is in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. That promise is fulfilled in the Catholic Church. It is not fulfilled in Anglicanism. It is not fulfilled in Protestantism. Protestantism is ephemeral, it is intellectual. Catholicism is ephemeral and intellectual, but it is also corporeal. Mm -hmm. And we need to have a corporeal presence. Father, could we have your blessing? Indeed. As we close the program. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. Thank Appreciate you. your witness. Why don't you tell the audience again that, that website that they could contact you if they have any questions about the Anglican news. Indeed. Uh, uh, www.stthomasmoresociety. Saint spelled out? No, it's S-T. Okay. S-T, uh, stthomasmoresociety.org. And more uh, is only one O. Okay. <laughs> St. Thomas More Society. Dot org. All right. And there are a number of Catholic youth parish, uh, Anglican youth parishes around the country, is that right? That's right. There's, a, there's an Anglican youth uh, community up in Boston, St. Athanasius. There is one in Corpus Christi. Uh, there's another one in Houston, Our Lady of Walsingham. Beautiful, brand new church. You ought to go see that. Uh, Our Lady of the Atonement in San Antonio is the first. And St. Mary the Virgin in, in uh, Arlington, Texas. All right. In fact, I have uh, Father Bradford 
right? He's up in uh, Father in Bradford is in Boston. Yes, indeed. he's been on the program a number yes. of years ago. Uh, need to have him back. It's been a long time, so he's doing. Yeah. And uh, it's always encouraging to get his newsletter that he sends out. Absolutely. You know, monthly. So it's wonderful. Thank you very much for your witness, and uh, and we do pray for the the return of our Anglican and Episcopalian brothers and sisters. So God bless. Thank Absolutely. You very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. And, uh, you know, sometimes even lifelong Catholics, those of us that have really learned the faith, need to, to, to take time to examine all the teachings of the church so that we are truly faithful in our witness to Christ and His church. God bless you. See you again next week.